It's day 31 of Sport SA Daily Diary, and today we're chatting to the first South African to ride in and win a stage of the Tour de France, Robbie Hunter. Good morning, Robbie. How are we doing? Uh, all the way in Switzerland. Yep, uh, not too bad. Uh, obviously, uh, yeah, slowly coming out of the whole Corona thing our side. So yeah, and, but we, but again, we haven't had much of a crazy lockdown like you guys are in South Africa. So we, we're not too claustrophobic at the moment. Eh? All good. You guys are allowed to get out and uh, go for a ride or a run or or things like that. Yeah, we, yeah, we have. I mean, we've been pretty, like I said, pretty easy on the whole lockdown situation. So I mean, it's probably uh, it's probably the fittest I've been in six years because we're allowed to go out and obviously no one's working, so people get out and are doing you know hiking and riding and that kind of stuff. So yeah, no, it's, it's we've been we've been really lucky. Uh, that's good. So, I mean, talking about being fit, you had an amazing cycling career uh, many years ago. Um, did you take up cycling from a young age? Was it always something that had an interest for you? Um, yeah, it, I, I must have. And I started probably when I think I was about eight, nine years old. Um, so it was something that, I mean, actually a couple of my friends got into. Um, they They got me into the sport and then um, you know, ever since then, I just kind of continued riding, and uh, it was obviously something that I, I, I excelled at. And really, it definitely, definitely worked out nice that you enjoy something you could do it as a career. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, there's it's a few people that can do that. Robbie, when did you, um, from sort of young age, when did you think that this actually may be a career for you, and it may be a, a lifestyle and and something you could pursue further than just a, a normal career? Uh, it's you know it's, it's it's always a it's a hard question to answer but I mean I think at the end of the day um, obviously going through school you know you you, you see people uh, or, or watch television and you see the guys racing the Tour de France and everyone's like oh you know you want to do that because that's the biggest event in the world and you know, that's when you kind of get the idea like I'd like to try and be a, a professional um, but I think honestly for me when you started well I started realizing that there was the possibility of doing it I was probably I think about the age of 17 18 just finishing school and then um, I honestly didn't know what to do kind of thereafter. So I took took kind of a year off from actual studying or anything like that. And then uh, it was kind of that year that I went overseas to Belgium for a couple of months. And um, while I was in Belgium, <coughs> sorry, while I was in Belgium, it actually turned out that uh, uh, I had some really good results on the international scene. And uh, that's probably the, the first time when I thought, okay, um, I know there's a good chance that I could, uh, you know, try and make a career out of this from you know, from a from a how can I say a sporting perspective where you know you've actually got the quality. You know, it's probably the first time you, I would say, it stood out, and I thought, okay, um, you know, the capabilities are there at least. And Robbie, obviously, you'd been riding in South Africa, you've been racing here. Was it was it a big step up when you went overseas to Belgium? Um, it, it was. Um, racing in Europe is a whole lot different to what it is in South Africa. Um, you know, cycle, road cycling is very different and mountain biking the same. You can't compare it to, you know, the likes of track and field where you're judging everything just by distance or, or single time. Um, you know, you can you can train yeah. for the 10,000 meters on the track uh, and you know what time you need to, to beat to be world class. Cycling, it's not like that. I mean, in South Africa, you go and you race 100 Ks on the weekend, um, but you're only usually as good as your competition. So if the guys around you are... Uh, riding what we call it a three-hour August in South Africa, you're going to ride a three-hour August, and you're just going to want to beat them. Um, whereas on the international scene, the the, the, the depth is there, um, the racing is just so much harder, so much faster. Um, so we, we we still in South Africa <clears throat> lack lack that depth, um, and the guys yeah you know, the guys aren't up to standard until they really get to Europe to actually start you know getting better. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, you turned pro in, in uh, 1999, um, and you went on to win a stage at the Volta Espana at one of the, the big three in, in your first year. I mean, that's an incredible achievement. Yeah, it's uh, quite unusual, to be honest. Um, but yes, I mean, it, uh, I, I, there was also, I think, a little bit of luck involved. I mean, there was a bit of an incident, um, you know, a crash within the bunch as well. Uh, in, in the last two kilometers and you know that also possibly helped but I mean, at the end of that I still won the stage <laughs> against Robbie McEwen yep. and, and a couple other guys and no it's, uh, it was my first victory actually as a as a professional and you know doing it in one of the grand tours was was quite special 
Um, and yeah, like like I said before, it's not it's not that common that uh, guys win their first pro race in, in a grip. So um, definitely a standout moment in in my career. Um, and honestly, it set it set a bit of a precedent for you know for what I was expecting from myself uh, for for the rest of my career racing in Europe. Yeah. I mean, again, you, you continued that with some amazing form. In, you won another stage in Volta in 2001. But more importantly, in 2001, you became the first South African to compete in the Tour de France. Yep. Now, how was that as, as an experience? Yeah, huge. Um, you know, again, from a cycling perspective, there is no event bigger than the Tour de France. And uh, even from a, from a sporting perspective in South Africa, um, it, it, the Tour de France stands out to everybody. It's not only people who follow cycling. You know, the, funnily enough, but the, the, the Tour de France has got a huge following worldwide by people who don't specifically follow cycling. Um, and I, it really stood out for me even more so when I when I raced the Tour and I started getting messages from people who literally were saying that guys like, well, you know, we're not cyclists. We don't follow cycling, but every year we watch a few stages of the Tour de France. And yeah. um, <clears throat> that, that really, uh, you know, kind of... Uh, I kind of said stood out in, in the sense that you know you realize how big the Tour de France really is. Um, and as a young guy coming from South Africa, where no one's been there, done that, and you know you you quickly start thinking, wow, this this is actually bigger than you think. Um, but yeah. no, it was it was it was a really big moment for me. And then you know having seen seen some South Africans on the side of the road and and that kind of stuff, it was yeah really really good standout <laughs> point in time, I suppose for me for sure. And then 2007, you went on to win a stage at the Tour de France. No, you, I mean, you just keep on stepping up and up and up. <laughs> um, no, you know, having ridden the Tour f a few times, and I'd won, by that point, by 2007, I'd won races pretty much on every continent. And um, But again, I mean, the Tour de France was the biggest thing. I mean, I came close in my, I came close in, in my first, uh, my first Tour, um, you know, I'd worn the white jersey in the Tour de France before, which is obviously the Young Riders jersey. I uh, I almost won a stage, um, but then again, it's you know until you really win a stage, you know nothing comes close. You know when you when you do win a stage like I did in 2007, a couple of years later, um, obviously for, after my first tour, but um, you know it's something that you always want to do. Uh, there's there's not many riders that race uh, you know through their pro pro career and actually end up winning a stage in the tour. So I mean honestly, while while I only won one stage. It's it's still a huge kind of milestone in anyone's career as a professional cyclist. Um, you know there are definitely guys out there like Cavendish uh, and, and the likes who you know who you know Mark Cavendish is what won 23, 24 stages something like that. Um, mm -hmm. You know the guys like Mario Cipollini and, and a few other guys who who win numerous stages. Um, but so I mean in, in a 16 year career I won one stage, but I mean there's there's other people who go through the whole career not winning a single stage in any race. Um, exactly. And so, yeah, for me, it was uh, for me it was a really big thing. And, I mean, you know, we, we don't even have to look that far. We see what happened last year with their Olympia and uh, how much it meant to him. Um, yeah. and, and, again, it's uh, you only really understand that, you know, how big it is personally for you um, when you get to that point in time. You go, okay, well, I've just won a stage. Um, I mean, you, you can win races through, through your career and – on different continents and it doesn't matter where it is, but the Tour de France is just bigger, better, stands out so much, um, so much more. So, yeah. Rob, you did actually win races <clears throat> on other continents. You won the 2004 Tour of Qatar. You yep. won the points classification at the Tour de Suisse. Any moment other than from the big three that stands out for you as, as a real sort of goosebump memory moment? <sighs> It's a hard one to answer because <clears throat> I could I could probably remember most of my big trees. Um, I, I don't want to say all, but I, there was a lot. I mean, winning two stages in, in the Tour of Switzerland one year was was fantastic because um, at that point in time, Switzerland was kind of like my uh, my home away from home, living in Europe. That's where I, you know I was uh, basing myself, um, and you know, winning winning two stages there, which were for me. Two standout stages because again, not being a not being a climber, I won the two mountain top finishes in the Tour of Switzerland that year. So, um, yeah, there's, there's there's a lot of races that I that I can pinpoint because um, honestly, every one of them, um, you, you kind of work towards goals and and sometimes things go wrong. You get sick, you you know, you try and come back. And I think almost every victory that <clears throat> that I had along the way, 
meant something because you know there was always something going on leading up to that point. So when you get to the point where you really achieve it, you know that that, that specific goal, yeah, it it's, it stands up. Um, so honestly, for me, I don't think it was a a victory that I just went down. Well, that was easy and kind of threw it out the window, and 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 I don't remember it. Um, every one of my victories, I think I, I dare say I can remember, and they, they really meant something to me. So. And Rob's um, cycling has had a it's had its tough times, it's had its ups and downs. Um, what was it like not going so well when the sort of drug issues were being brought to a fall? Uh, were the guys that weren't involved was there like animosity between them and the, and the guys that were? Um, I think there, there, there was not. I think I know there was. Um, but then again, honestly, I think it's a, I think it's an attitude as well to the way the way you perceive things and the way you accept things. And um, there definitely was a couple of guys who, who made enemies um, publicly, saying that you know other guys are doping and they're not. And uh, but honestly, <clears throat> spending spending time on things like that. Uh, was for me personally was a waste of energy uh, you know you you let stuff like that consume you and you miss you, you miss what you're trying to achieve and the goals are in front of you and so i mean honestly for for a guy like myself uh you know you you saw and you heard and you you you, you knew things were going on around you but i never let it get to me personally because i didn't want to go and spend all my energy chasing on you know on on, on rumors and and what other people were doing i wanted to try and focus on what i was doing which was trying to win bike races as clean as possible and you know, and do it in the right way. Um, but yes, to answer your, your question, there were people who, uh, who who stood out and, you know, threw accusations around and made enemies um, of the likes of Lance Armstrong, whoever else. And, um, but I think, like I said, at the end of the day, I think they made themselves be very unliked uh, in those times. Um, not that they were wrong, um, because again, we, um, you know, they had all the right to to say guys were cheating and uh, and they shouldn't be doing it. Um, but I honestly, looking back at those guys, I think they probably did themselves more than injustice um, because they ended up letting things like that consume them too much. Um, yeah. And they ended up a guy like um, uh, what was his name, Simeone, I think his name was, and you know, had a massive row with, with Lance. And again, you know, Lance was the guy who was actually. You know, did wrong back at the, in the in the time, but the guys who got, who got the biggest uh, fallout from the situation when that was all going on were the guys that were trying to speak out. So it was it definitely wasn't easy for them, and they definitely uh, it, 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 uh, they they made themselves kind of like the public enemy as well, which wasn't ideal for them. Yeah, and Robbie, who is I mean, strange question, but who's the toughest rider that you rode against? Who do you feel was really head and shoulders? Was there someone that was head and shoulders stronger than anyone else at that time? Um, that's a hard question to answer. Um, honestly, a lot of people might not like my answer, but I think I'll, I'll answer it in two ways. I mean, um, one from a, from a talent perspective, and I'll answer from a guy who's gotten results and, and uh, who, who's done quite a lot in the sport. I think from a talent perspective, um, a guy by the name of Oscar Freire, who's a three-time world champion uh, out of Spain, um, super humble person, um, but just an incredible, incredible athlete. Um, you know, he'd, he'd not ride his bike for three months, come back within in two weeks, and be able to go and win Milano San Remo. Um, just, just an absolute, absolute phenom of a person. Just nothing that you've seen before. Um, and then, honestly, yes, uh, you know, a hard guy who who I really think was different to other people was definitely Lance Armstrong. Um, uh, you know, we, we all know now that he's gone through his uh, he's admitted to doping and he did what he did and things like that, and it's it's all public history. Uh, public. But you know, there were there were so many other people during that time who were doing the same thing. Um, yeah. So. It's, Look, looking at the, the, the full situation, um, knowing, knowing him the way I do as well, um, he was a standout person. Uh, he was a hard character, uh, at times not a very nice guy towards other people, but that also is what made him uh, really the champion that he was. And he trained harder than other people. He, uh, you know, and it wasn't because of the doping that he could train harder. He, he was also 
I mean, he was a, a world-class athlete at the age of 21. He won world championships at the age of 21 in the worst conditions uh, that, uh, imaginable. Uh, one of the hardest races world championships have ever seen um, up in Moore. And, you know, so people today who stand up and say, well, you know, Lance, only, he was only good because he doped. It's 100%. Um, he, he was a different character and he was an exceptionally, exceptionally talented sports person. He knew what he wanted, a very driven person. So, you know, who was a hard person in the sport? Lance definitely was. Yeah, I mean, I, I must 100% agree with you. I think what he did was wrong, absolutely. But the fact of where he came from uh, after his cancer, after his illness, got yeah. back to being a professional cyclist and got back to being top of the game. Yeah. You know, they say he got to the top of the <clears throat> He was doping, but I, you know, I still feel he would have been there and thereabouts without it. Look, I mean, if you if if you try and compare a few guys, I mean, you take another guy. I mean, I never raced with Craig LeMond. Uh, obviously, I was following him as as a young guy myself on TV when he was winning two and things like that. And you know, he also came back from uh, uh, quite a hard accident, you know, being shot and things like that. And he came back and he still continued to win. Um, again, exceptional, exceptional athlete. There's no doubt about it. But I can't talk. I can't say how good he was. It wasn't because I never raced with uh, Greg. You know, he, he stopped when I when I got into professional racing. And but in, in, in my time as racing over the past, really the past uh, 20 years, Lance definitely was a standout person and uh, uh, exceptionally, exceptionally hard guy, exceptionally talented. Like I said, I mean, having won world championships at the age of 21, it's not something that happens just for free. Uh, not in those kinds of conditions. It's the same thing. Um, that happened, um, you know, our, our current world champion who who won last year, same thing, um, in, in, yeah. in Yorkshire. Young guy, super talented. But again, who was the last young guy who won world championships in in those kinds of... It doesn't happen. You know, it's, it's very... not. Uh, it's not the norm, let's put it that way. Um, the world championships usually their races won by an experienced rider who's, you know, who's strong, who's, who knows how to win races. And like I said, Lance Armstrong could come in and win at the age of 21 he always was an exceptional person, even before he, you know, he got onto the whole doping scenario. It's just, those are just facts. Yeah, no, without a doubt. Um, Rob, you didn't only win overseas; you also won at home. Um, you won the national time trial champs in in 2000. You won the August in 2008, and you won the the road race national champs in 2012. Mm -hmm. Great honor wearing um, South African colours over those seasons that that preceded those two uh, national championships. Yeah, look, I mean, again, I, I never raced nationals uh, as much as I should have during my career. Um, there's there's a lot of emphasis that's been put on the national championships titles and, and jerseys over the past, I'd say, 10, 15 years. Um, but at the start of my career, it wasn't like that. People gave uh, notice to the Europeans, uh, jerseys, so the Italians, the French, the Germans, uh, no one really cared about if you came from America or if you came from South Africa and you had your national jersey on it. It just was nothing that people cared about, and and even less so the teams. Um, yeah. So you know, when I was going back to South Africa, well, I wanted to say to the team, "Well, I want to go and race nationals." I'm like, "Oh, come on, we've got another race to do. Uh, you know, let's go and do um, whatever the classics." And it, it always used to fall kind of in in that area for me. So it was it was almost impossible that I could race nationals. Uh, I did race it once or twice, but but it was always hard for me to. Uh, come and do it. I mean, uh, you know, these days you see Daryl, who's, uh, I think for the past eight eight years, he's won you know, the, the, the time trial championships and he wears it every year in Europe and it's fantastic to have the jersey, yeah. Um, when yeah. I won the national title, you know, again, it was towards the end of my career, so I was super happy that I could actually represent the jersey in Europe. Um, it took whatever, 13, 13 years into my career, eventually, I think, roughly like that, that I managed to race with the jersey in Europe, and it was nice because at that point in time, people started uh, having more recognition for for wanting the jerseys in the peloton. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, honestly, I, I dare say as well that if I raced nationals, you know, kind of throughout my career, I probably would have won it five, six, seven times. Yeah. Um, just from just from a level of, uh, you know, I've been racing on a higher level than most guys in South Africa, so the, the possibilities of me having won it a few more times were were quite real. Um, but again, I mean, I, I, just, I just wasn't in South Africa racing uh, the national title often. Uh, I wasn't there often enough to race it. So, you know, I, I just continued to race my, my European races. So it didn't really mean much for us. Yeah. Um, 
but yeah, like I said, I mean, when it when I did race with it, then it, it was eventually it was fantastic to have the jersey in Europe, and I, I really enjoyed it. Tell me about um, South African races and and the guys like Daryl. There are a, f- a good few names coming through. Uh, you got your Daryl, you got JP, you got Louis, uh, Nick Lamini. It's great to see these young South Africans starting to make a name for South African cycling, all probably because they're following in, in your footsteps. Yeah, look, I mean, uh, Daryl, Daryl's been keeping, uh, honestly, the, the South African flag flying exception high the last couple of years. And, you know, since I stopped, he's really, um, he's actually, I'd say, boomed quite a bit uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, it's good. So it's good to have a South African um, you know, racing at that level and that consistently, um, it's fantastic to see. And there's obviously a couple other guys, like you said, uh, younger guys coming through. Um, you know, Louis Mankis is obviously a guy who, from from a South African perspective, and um, exceptionally talented. Um, you know, he's finished three times inside the top ten of, of Grand Tours, which is uh, on on um, you know looking at it from a from a, an agent or, or a team's perspective, that's quite exceptional. A guy who was under the age of 24, really, yeah. really talented young rider. Um, he's had one or two difficult seasons. Uh, he's, he's coming back to his best again, I think. And, but yeah, there's, there's some other exceptional talent that has come out of South Africa the past couple of years, um, obviously with the help of, of Doug Ryder and his team now, MTT. Um, a guy like Stefan de Bart, another super, super young talent. Um, and, uh, you know, a guy like Ryan Gibbons, there's, there's definitely a few guys that are now um, performing on, a, on an international level. Um, and I think uh, in the next five, six years, there's, we can have a consistent number of South Africans winning in Europe, which obviously um, we haven't had in the past. I mean, it was myself and us, Daryl, but uh, real guys winning in Europe, there wasn't many. Um, but I think with the, the, the pool of athletes that are kind of coming about now, um, I think there's more than enough guys that are capable of racing and winning on, in Europe. Yeah, which is really great for South African cycling scene. It is yep. such a huge sport in, in the country. Yep. Um, Daryl, uh, Rob, after your um, career ended, you became director of sportif for Garmin Sharp for two years. Yep. How was yep. that as an experience? Really good. I mean, it was nice. It was a nice transition from getting off the bike and still staying involved in the sport um, and and doing that. I mean, it's it gives you a very different perspective to to what actually goes on behind the scenes. I mean, all professional athletes live in a bit of a bubble. Um, you know, they they think the world revolves around them. Um, they go training, they come home, they go to races, they get looked after. Life is fantastic. Um, but most of them don't really realize that outside of their little bubble, there's other people making sure that they can be professional athletes. Yes, they know they're there, but it doesn't come into their full consideration. Um, and yeah, when, when, when you know you I became a sports director for the team and you start dealing on a daily basis, morning to night with the masters and the swan, you know, the swannies and the mechanics and the doctors and the, the chiros and these kinds of people, and you see, you know, what goes into actually making sure that the cyclists can get out of bed at uh, eight o'clock in the morning and go and have breakfast and then you know come back and go and ride his bike for, for a couple of hours and then you know he's, he's done his day. Um, and the staff continue to work until 10, 11 at, at night sometimes. So it gets the effect of actually um, the, the, the behind the scenes stuff and how much respect you need to have for, um, for those people because um, you know, they're the, the unseen heroes of actually making sure that we as sports fans can actually see what's actually, uh, follow the sport on TV and see what's going on. Which, and uh, yeah, so from, from that perspective, it's, uh, it gave me a lot of, understanding of what else there is within the sport that people need to know. Um, and an understanding of maybe what you're doing now. So you've moved into sure. uh, to uh, agent management. How is that going? Really good. Um, it was always my, my, my idea and, and intention to move into uh, kind of athlete management. Um, since, I, um, since I stopped cycling or my last couple of years, I was thinking what I was going to do and this is what, what I wanted to do. Um, but yes, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely helped, you know, being, having, having understood, like I said, from an athlete um, and then actually working for a team as a, as a, as a, a sports director, knowing how things function, um, what's needed of athletes and the way the teams actually look at or the way the teams actually look at the athletes when they choose them to go to certain events and what, the, um, you know, what decisions the teams need to make behind 
you know, filling up of rosters to certain events. So it's a, it's a, it, gives, it gave me a really good understanding. Also now when I speak to my athletes, you know, you it's not just a, a perspective, okay, well, um, you know, you need to get fit, ride your bike, and, you know, you become a professional. There's, there's so much more that you can actually teach and tell the athletes about how things work. And the more information they get, um, you know, the, the better for them to try and kind of maneuver their way through their, through their careers. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, everything everything I've done, even being a sports director, has definitely helped me in, uh, in in what I'm doing right now as a as an athlete manager. And giving advice to youngsters, mm-hmm. what if you had to say the most important piece of advice, what would that be? Uh, it's a good one. Not um, putting you on the spot, though. No, no, no. Honestly, perseverance. Um, you know, it's it's never easy, especially coming from South Africa, and you know, we're talking mainly to South African audience and. I would say perseverance definitely because, uh, like I said, coming from South Africa as a cyclist, it's not easy to get to Europe. It's often your, you know, your mom and dad's money. Um, you never know, you know if you're going to get the opportunity when you do get to Europe because there's another thousand or, or five thousand athletes that are trying to do the same thing. But um, uh, what I have noticed is it's the guys who want it the most. Um, mm. Doesn't matter where you come from, how much money you got, makes no difference. Uh, if you want it and, and you persevere, there's a huge chance you'll make it happen. Oh, brilliant. Rob, thanks so much for joining us today on Sport SA Daily Diary. Been brilliant to chat. Um, thanks. Appreciate it. Good luck with the opening of lockdown in, in uh, Switzerland next week. Lovely. All right. Good. Take care. Yeah, soon, bud. Cheers. Catch us again tomorrow on Sport SA Daily Diary, where we chat to Netball South Africa's latest goal machine, Siggy Berger.